QuickBooks Online 2024 refund. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com receipt form. Get ready and pack some trail mix because we're hiking on QuickBooks Online, our audit trail to success. Here we are online in our browser, searching for QuickBooks Online test drive, looking for the result that has Intuit.com in the URL, Intuit being the owner of QuickBooks, selecting the United States version of the software and verifying that we're not a robot. Opening up our reports like we do every time. Reports on the left-hand side, right-clicking on the balance sheet and open link in new tab. I'm going to right-click on the profit and loss and then open link in new tab. The new tabs are up top. Closing the hamburger, there's our balance sheet. Tabbing to the right, closing the hamburger, there's our profit and loss. Tab back to the left. That's the setup process we do every time. Data input on the left-hand tab. Checking the results on the financial statements to the tabs to the right. Selecting the drop-down, we've been looking at the customer cycle, noting that we could have an easier or more difficult customer cycle. The easiest cycle being one possibly where we're reliant on the bank feeds using the deposit form to record revenue. Slightly more complicated would be a system where we have a cash register, sales receipts, then being recorded at the point of sales, followed by deposit forms, and then reconciled with bank feeds and or bank reconciliations. And accrual method where we have an invoice, cre increase in accounts receivable, receiving the payment, and then recording the deposit, followed by the matching to the bank reconciliation or the bank feeds. So we've been looking then at the credit memo form we took a look at in a prior presentation. We're going to look at a similar type of process, but has a distinct difference, that being the refund uh, receipt form. So to think about the differences, let's go on over to a flowchart just to give a quick look. This is a QuickBooks desktop flowchart, but we're just looking at the flow of the forms, which will in essence be the same for any accounting type process. So if you had a full service accrual accounting system and we invoiced somebody, then that's going to record accounts receivable increasing and revenue. If we have not yet received a payment from them and they returned the goods, that's when we might have the credit memo involved. The credit memo, in essence, reversing the invoice. We saw how we can tweak it a little bit, possibly to record allowance uh, or for sales returns or possibly record something to bad debt if we need to increase the accounts receipt or decrease the accounts receivable for items that we're not going to be collecting on or possibly take it to an allowance account. All of those have to do with the accounts receivable that we need to decrease even though we have not yet received a payment. But what if we have received a payment? We've got a payment already and we've made the deposit already and then they come back and say, I'm going to return this piece of, piece of uh, merchandise. Well, at that point, we have to say, if we're going to give them a refund, then uh, they've already paid us. So we don't, we, we're not going to decrease the accounts receivable. Instead, we'd have to actually issue them a check. And if we're going to issue them a check, then you would think we would just write a check or use an expense form. But if we use an expense form, then we can't really see that. That would be... When we write a check, what happens is that comes out of the uh, vendor side of things. That would be part of the vendor cycle. And we're writing a check as a as a, a return here. So we want it to be linked to the customer side. So when I look in the customer center, I can see what happened. I can track and see what happened. So that's one reason that we want to use a refund receipt form possibly in that situation. Also, 
if they returned inventory, then we have to re deal with the return of inventory and the refund receipt form will reverse that inventory transaction that we're now receiving in a similar way as we saw uh, with uh, the credit memo. So now we're imagining a situation where we either issued an invoice or we could have the sales receipt, which would both put us in the same situation. Imagine someone ordered something and then they paid it or they went into a store and they purchased it at the cash register. So we use the sales receipt form. In both cases, they've already paid us. And so now if we're going to reverse that transaction, that means we're gonna issue them money possibly, in which case we don't wanna use a check because they're a customer and therefore we're going to use this refund receipt, which is kind of like a type of check. So let's do the full process again. Let's make an invoice and we'll then imagine this whole system again. So we'll do this fairly quick because I know we've done this a few times on the invoice side at least. Customer number one, I'm gonna add the customer, boom. We're gonna say this happens on 010124 and I'm gonna call this item number one, item number one, tab. And we'll add an inventory item, item number one. And we're gonna say that that's going to be a description item one. Let's say we sell it for 160 this time and cost is gonna be 100. So we should have a $60 profit this time on the sale. It will be subject to sales tax just to make it a little bit more complex. Let's save it and close it. Uh, we have to put some on hand. I'll say 10 on hand. QuickBooks will make a journal entry for the purchase as of we'll say the 1st of December, 2023 because we wanna focus on the sales side, the invoice side here. So let's save it and close it. And so there's what we sold. What's this gonna do? Let's map it out over here in Excel. So I'm gonna say Excel, what's gonna happen? It's an invoice. It's gonna increase the accounts receivable. And it's gonna increase our revenue account, which I'm gonna call income in our worksheet here. We're selling it for 160, credit 160. The sales tax is gonna increase which I think is 8%. So it's gonna be equals this times 0.08 or 8%. Therefore the AR negative sum plug of 172. So there's the 172 that we're gonna collect. And then we're also gonna have the inventory, which is gonna go down. Uh, so the cost of goods sold is gonna be debited and inventory is gonna go down. And that was for 100. 100. So accounts receivable is going to go up. We're going to have inventory goes down. And we're going to have the uh, sales uh, tax is going to be uh, hold on a second. Wait a second. <laughs> In we're going to have income is going to go up. The difference between those two is sales tax and then inventory is going to go down and cost of goods sold is going to go up the impact on the income statement is 60 dollars the income minus the cost of goods sold 60 dollars sales tax will be pay about payable in the future off the income statement on the balance sheet inventory went down accounts receivable went up let's check it out this way let's save it and close it go to the balance sheet and run it and take a look at the AR accounts receivable closing this out oh hold on back let's change the range 01012 I don't want to give a review 01012 I'm trying to do something here 123124 stop doing that bugging me all right it didn't record let's run it again and we're going into the accounts receivable and there it is okay that's for the full amount if i go into the profit and loss and run it here 010124 tab 12 12 31 24 run it so there we have the 160 that's just what we sold it for not including the sales tax the sales tax is going to be over here in uh, the board of equalization there's the sales tax and we have the inventory that's going to go down inventory is being decreased and 
we have the cost of goods sold over here, which is going up by the 100. The difference between the 160 and the 100 is $60. And on the balance sheet, we can track the sub ledger of, of accounts receivable, going to the tab to the right, right clicking, duplicating, going to the reports on the left hand side and down to who owes you we're on the customer balance detail let's say and we have the customer there it is the total of this report 602432 ties out to the balance sheet 602 uh where's five four hold on hold on the total is 545432 so over here 545432 and then the in, the inventory is also necessary to track on a sub ledger right click in the tab to the right one more sub ledger to check out this whole invoice process reports typing in inventory valuation summary closing the ham boogie range change 123124 run it so there we put nine on there we sold one nine remaining total 149625 tying out over here 149625 okay let's say that they paid us now so let's go internally sales side customers hamburger close customer number one we're going to receive the payment Let's go, let's go into the customer and then receive the payment. So I'm going to go in here and then say receive the payment. It's customer number one. Let's say this happens in February. So 2124 payment. Let's just say it's going to be cash and it's going to go into, I'm just going to, well, it doesn't matter whether it goes into undeposited or the checking account. Let's just put it into the checking account for our purposes here. The point is they already paid us. So this is going to be then decreasing the accounts receivable and going into the checking account. So if I recorded that over here, we're going to say now we've got pay receive payment receive payment is going to be cash is going to be going up and the other side is going to be going out of AR for the amount of 17280. So cash going up 17280 and accounts receivable going down by 17280 but we also need to track it in that sub ledger right that's going to be the key so i'm going to say save it and close it and so there there we have that if i go to the balance sheet and run it we're going to say okay in the accounts receivable account it went up went back down back it went into the checking account and it went into the checking account here no impact on the income statement from that transaction and the ar sub ledger should go back down if i go into the internal report we can see here that the invoice has been paid so now the customer comes back and says okay look i, I want to return this item well they've already paid us this time so i can't issue the credit memo right i can't so easily go credit memo they've already paid us credit memo decreases the accounts receivable instead we might go to so you might say well i can just pay them a check well we'll just give you a check don't give us a bad yelp review we'll write you a check but the check is out of the vendor side of things so i don't want to write them a check for 172.80 because i won't be able to track it in my vendor cent i mean in my customer center uh here it'll be on the vendor side so and i won't be able to deal with the inventory if they're returning inventory so instead we're going to go to the sales receipt so let's make a sales receipt uh hold on a sec is that right that's not right what am i what did i say instead we're going to go to a refund receipt refund receipt big difference all right so this is going to be customer number one and we'll just mirror what we did before i probably should have opened the other forms as a best practice so i can have it side by side but we'll say this happened on the third and let's say that uh this is going to be a refund receipt we're going to say it's going to be a check and we're going to say it was for item number one so i'm just mirroring 
the exact same thing uh, we did before. And so we have the same 172. So let's say this happened in a different period. I'm gonna copy this over to here. And then I'm gonna do the same thing we did before. I'm gonna copy this side and paste it, paste it one, two, three over here, remove this, and then change my equity to negative 30060. And so, so now I'm just gonna reverse what we did before exactly. So this is, except I'll have, so this is a refund receipt. So what's the refund receipt gonna do? Well, I could say it's gonna reverse exactly what we had before, except we already got paid on this accounts receivable. So this, so, so I can do what we did before in the credit memo. I just reverse everything like so. But here we already got paid. So I'm gonna change this instead to cash. So that might be the easiest way to kind of think about what is happening on this refund receipt. It's like a credit memo, except instead of instead of reversing the accounts receivable, you've already paid them. So it's basically like writing a check, but you might also have to deal with you know this. And then we also have the income account with the same issue we had before that we might not want to reverse the income state account, but rather put it into sales returns and allowances. So let's first do it this way. What would happen? Cash is going to go down now. Income, this is income is going to go down with a debit. And then the sales tax is going to be reversed. And then cost of goods sold is also going to go down. So the net impact is 60 on the negative side. And the inventory is going to go back up, assuming that they returned inventory that we're not going to put in inventory again. If not, then we wouldn't reverse this part because we didn't get the inventory back or the inventory is defective. Also, I'm gonna be taking this out of uh, the checking account. So it's coming out of the checking account. If it was a check number or if it was a check that was being written, we would need the number here. If it's an electronic transfer, then possibly we remove this so it will be similar to an expense form as opposed to like a check form because this will be kind of like a check form or expense form decrease in the checking account. So then we can save and close it jump on over to the balance sheet. And then on the balance sheet, we're gonna run the report, go into the checking account. So it should be a decrease to the checking account. So uh, here it is, but notice it's a refund form. So now we have a decrease, a refund form instead of an expense form or a check type of form. So there it is. If I close this back out and then go back, the other side is on the income statement. Let's run the income statement side by side, month by month this time. So we'll run it by months. So you can see then there's the what happened in January. There's the reversal that we put in uh, March. So then if I go back to the first tab, uh, the difference between those two is in the sales tax. So if I go down to the sales tax, we can see that we have that has been reversed. That looks good. And then we can see that the inventory, if I go into the inventory, it has been put back on the books. So we increased the inventory because we assumed that they gave it back to us. And then the other side is going to the income statement uh, right here. So the difference is $60, right? So we had a 60 negative versus the 60 positive on the sales side because we basically reversed it and issued the check since we already received the money. Now we have the same issue with this sales though. Sometimes we don't like the sales directly decreasing, right? We only want sales to go up and any returns to go into sales returns and allowances. And you might have a system where you didn't get the inventory back maybe, and you don't want to increase inventory with it, but you still want to issue a check, not with a check form, but rather the refund, because you want to be able to track it internally, as you can see here, where it nicely tracks internally, like with the credit memo, where we have the invoice and the invoice shows as being uh, paid uh, it shows us being paid and then we can see the refund all on the customer side of things. Otherwise it wouldn't be in here. It would be in the vendor side of things. And if they, if someone called in and they have another issue with it, people wouldn't be able to see it on this side of things. They'd have to go to the vendor and find whoever we wrote the check to. So let's do another one. This time we'll start 
instead of with an invoice and then receiving the payment, let's imagine we sold it at a cash register and go directly to the sales receipt. So we're on the sales side, someone came into the store, customer number two, and we're selling something to them. So we're gonna say, all right, and let's say this happened on 050124 and tab, tab, and the payment method, let's say is cash, and it's gonna go directly into the checking account. We're just gonna put it into the checking account for this particular purpose, which means it probably should have been a check. So then it goes directly and we have a check number. <laughs> Directly the check number. All right, so then we're gonna say it's item number one. Item number one again. And so now we're gonna say that that we sold one of them. So same, same transaction as we did before, except now instead of an invoice, it's a sales receipt. So what's gonna happen? We're gonna have cash go up by 172.80 instead of accounts receivable. The other side going to revenue 160, sales tax payable going up by 12.80. The inventory going down by the 100, not on the form, but driven by the item cost of goods sold going up by 100. Impact on net income, sales price 160 minus 100 or $60. And the sub ledger for inventory will also be impacted for the item that is sold. So let's go ahead and save and close it and then go to the balance sheet and check it out, run in the balance sheet. So we can see in the checking account, we've got an increase again of this time the sales receipt as opposed to uh, the payment on the invoice. And then the other side's going to the revenue account. So if I go to my income statement, there's the 160. And then the other, the difference between those two is going to sales tax into sales tax. So here's the sales tax again on the sales receipt this time. And then the cost of goods sold is going to be here. And the inventory is impacted here. So if I go to the inventory, boom. So inventory sales receipts going back down and the sub ledger for inventory once again is back down to nine because we sold that item this 149625 tying out to what's on the balance sheet 149625 uh, so now let's go into it internally go into the sales side customers closing the hand boogie and then go into the customers so there we have it so it's been paid now they return it so we're like okay they returned it but they've already paid it so we can issue them a check for 172 i could say i'm just going to go issue you a check but that's in the vendor center that'll mess us up so we don't want to do that we instead are going to go into the uh, refund receipt refund receipt form and so this is going to be for customer number two and let's say we issued the refund on 6124 and the payment method, let's say, was uh, was uh, cash, let's say. And then we're going to say it's coming out of the checking account. Let's say it's a check. It's a check. It's coming out of the checking account. But I'll delete the number because it's like an expense form. And then we're going to say it's for item, item number one. Boom. So here's the same amount, 172.80. But... Uh, we don't want it to go to the income account to reverse income. I want it to go to sales returns and allowances. So I'm going to do the same trick we did with, before with the credit memo. I'm going to make a new item. Sales returns and, and it's not an and and allowances. Ah, I thought I had it. I can't. I give up the spelling bee. I'll sit down. Just like I did in grade school the first time I had to spell something. I'll just sit, just, I'll just sit down, right? Just let me sit down from the start. Let's just, okay, this is going to be, uh, let's say, and this is going to go into a new one. And it's going to be an income type of account. We'll say it's a contra income account. And we'll say other income sales returns and allowances so i'm going to save it and close it and i'm not going to do well we'll keep the tax on it and save and close okay okay so then i'm just going to mirror the dollar amount 160 and then delete it from up top now why why do this because 
because I get to the same dollar amount down below, 172.80, but this one is now going to be recording it to the proper income account, which is the contra income account of sales returns and allowances. Whereas this one still does some work because it's tied to the inventory item because when they returned it, they gave us the inventory back. So we want to increase the inventory that we have received. Now note that if we didn't get the inventory back or it's defective, it's broken, maybe we just delete this line item altogether and then we won't record the second part of the journal entry where we get the inventory. That would be like, we don't record this bit because we didn't get the inventory back. Or maybe you record the inventory that we returned and then write it off as damaged or something like that if that's how, if that how, how it works. Depends on what your system is, but there it is. So let's go ahead and uh, save that. We should have a similar reversal process. Save and close. Refund successfully issued. So then I can see it in here and I can see it on the sales uh, side of things instead of the vendor side of things where we have, we have uh, the refund, the sales receipt, and then the refund. So I can see those two kind of linked up or that they most likely are together. So if the customer calls, has a question, we can see what it, what's going on. So if I go into the checking account on the balance sheet, we, uh, uh, Hold on a second. Why is there so much stuff in here? That's 2023. Run it to refresh it. Let's go in there again. There it is. So we got our refunds. So that looks right. Let's go back on over. Let's go to the income statement. Run it. Here's where the change happened. So instead of reversing it to a negative in to, to a negative income, here was the income. Then we reversed it to another account sales returns and allowances so that we have we can see the increase and uh, the decrease related to the returns instead of decreasing our sales account which we don't typically like to do the cost of goods sold also impacted so there's the increase of the 60 and then we decreased it in the following month of the 60 on the other side of things we can see that the uh, sales tax is going to be impacted here sales tax and if we go into that increase and decrease goes back down inventory account will be impacted let's go into it and we can see the inventory account has been increased and decreased back down and then or decrease and increased <laughs> and then we can see in the sub ledger that the sub ledger now we're back up to 10 items because it was returned we're now at the 159625 which should tie out to what's on our balance sheet over here, 159625. So bottom line, uh, if, if you have uh, someone wants to return someone something on the customer side and, and there's an AR issue, then you're dealing with credit memos, uh, most likely. But if they already paid you either through an invoice and then they receive the payment or from the sales receipt, sale at a cash register, then you possibly want to be using the refund receipt as opposed to the credit memo and as opposed to issuing them simply a check or a expense form so that you can properly account for things within the customer register instead of the vendor register and deal with inventory if inventory is involved.